This morning we're going to continue our series in the Gospel of John, and today I'm moving past chapter 6. I'll be re- we'll be revisiting that later, but I'm jumping ahead into John chapter 7 today. And the setting for the message today is that Jesus, we're looking at the life of Christ through the, the eyes of the Apostle John, and God inspired him to tell the stories as they are here because there are certain lessons in these stories that apply to us today. So the setting that we're entering today is that after performing several significant signs and wonders in public, um, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, they wanted to kill Jesus because he was not approaching things the way that they thought he should. And in their minds, Jesus was the Messiah. He would approach things in line with their traditions. They thought he, if he was the Messiah, he would approach things in line with their traditions. And they rejected him because they thought the true Messiah would come alongside of them. And, they would, and the true Messiah would endorse their traditions instead of doing things the way Jesus was doing, which conflicted with the way that they had been taught. And the Lord... The Lord, in our setting here, the Lord was becoming very well known amongst the people because of the great miracles that he was performing. And and um, and there was a lot of people out in is in the in the uh, in the region that were thinking about Jesus, and they were talking amongst themselves. They were thinking that despite what their religious leaders were saying about him, that Jesus could possibly be the Messiah. And as such, everyone was waiting with anticipation for Jesus to make a move to show. Uh, in a powerful way that he was the one that God had chosen to be their Savior. And uh, it was coming up to the Feast of Tabernacles. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to John 7, starting with verse 1. My message to you this morning is that God's timing is best. So starting with verse 1 in chapter 7, We read, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, we'll break there. Now Jesus, you understand, he had left the region of Judea and was back in his home region of Galilee, and if you know the uh, area um, of ancient uh, Israel during this time, during the Roman occupation, there was a province of Judea and a province of Galilee, and and the province of Galilee was to the north of Judea. It was in kind of what they would consider um, the backwater region of, of Israel. All the Jews considered Galilee to be kind of the place where the hillbillies or the rednecks lived. (laughs) You know, all the people kind of right, like around here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone in the coast says, you're beyond hope. Well, we say they're beyond hope, but... (laughs) But this, uh, Jesus was kind of in the background in the region of Galilee, which was not where um, typically there was anything happening. As far as the religious world goes, the the epicenter of the religious world was actually around Jerusalem. So, Jesus was in the region of Galilee because he was a wanted man. He had said some things that made the religious leaders want him dead. What a sad commentary on things though, eh? Jesus had gone... And done great miracles in Judea. I mean, he healed the crippled man on the Sabbath and explained to those who were listening to him the truth of the fact that he was the Son of God and and he was performing other miracles, great miracles. We're going to go back to chapter 6. Pastor Jonathan is going to preach the first chapter part of chapter 6 where Jesus fed the multitudes. So these miracles that Jesus had done... It didn't seem to matter to the religious authorities of that time. He wasn't doing things the way that they thought he should do. So they were looking for a way to kill him. And Jesus was 
hiding out in Galilee. Hiding out. Hmm. Now, it wasn't certainly a lack of courage on Jesus' part that made him back off and go to Galilee. Jesus, you see, had an understanding of the perfect timing of God that no one else did. Jesus knew that it was not yet time for him to be arrested, delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, and for his crucifixion. It wasn't time yet. He had more work to accomplish before that. He certainly would be put to death. He would be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, as we know through reading the Scriptures and as we believe, as He's come and and died on the cross for our sins and was raised again. We know that He did that, but this was not the time. God, you see, has perfect timing for things that He does. In His sovereign plan, God orchestrates the timing of things and his timing is never off, never off. And that goes with anything that takes place. It's never too early or too late. It's exactly at the time that God designs it to be. Now, the setting for this chapter was near the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. For those of you who are not aware of what the Jewish feasts are or what they meant... The Feast of Tabernacles was also called the Feast of Booths. And this was a feast that was held um, every year in the fall, kind of between the end of September and the beginning of October. Um, it was an eight-day feast. And it, be, be, it started just at the time that the harvest was over. It was a joyous celebration. And, and the Israelites, what they're doing with this particular feast that God had instituted is they were celebrating the, the protection of God in the, in the 40 years that they traveled through the desert regions after being delivered from Egypt. They wandered through the desert and they had to live in temporary shelters wherever they went for 40 years. So, for the Jews, it was a special, significant celebration that showed that God was with them even in the middle of barren places and the middle of places that... Um, were, uh, were difficult. And in preparation for the feast, people would pilgrimage to Jerusalem and erect temporary booths or structures for shelter. That's why it's called the Feast of Tabernacle or the Feast of Booths. Is they'd, they'd make a temporary shelter. Now, they didn't go to Canadian Tire and have the pop-up tents that we have nowadays, right? That wasn't how it worked. So they, they made a structure out of wood and they covered it with palm fronds or different tree branches. This was how they did it. So they would all go, families would go from all of the outlying areas, from all over the place, and they'd gather around Jerusalem and they'd make these booths and they'd have this celebration. And uh, people would attend there and they would offer sacrifices to the Lord in honor of the, of the fact that He had preserved them as a people through the desert in their past. It was a memorial to remember. So, families would go. They'd all go together. And unfortunately, Jesus' half-brothers had a very shallow view of how Jesus was to live his life. Now, I'd like to talk about this for a second. Now, sometimes we wonder, well, why didn't his brothers believe right away? Like, what's with that? Well, think about this for a second. You're in a family, and your oldest brother... Jesus, okay. He's someone that uh, your mom and dad say to you is very special. Well, I'm special too. But this, the first son, is very special. And no doubt those brothers and sisters, the brothers, would uh, listen to the stories that were told by mom and dad of what the angels had said about him, about wise men that came from the east, and provided financial donations to the family. And, and, and can you imagine if you're a younger brother of Jesus and your older brother never sinned? Can you imagine that? The oldest brother in the family never did wrong. I don't know about you, but that would blow my mind as a kid. 
Because I, I got into some mischief. I, I don't know about you, but most kids do. Because we have a sinful nature. But Jesus was born without sin. So knowing that your oldest brother never pulled his sister's hair or got into mischief, it might have a deep effect on you, wouldn't it? You know, if my older brother was a sinless model of wisdom and what an ideal son should be, I might feel a little bit of resentment or insecurity because I know for a fact that I'm a sinner and I could never measure up to that standard. I might have a difficult time. I might have resentment. I might have jealousy to sort through. I might have difficult, a difficult time believing that my brother was different than I was. At any rate, this is all speculative, but you can you look at that, right? That's how they would honestly be feeling. So at this point, Jesus' brothers, they didn't believe that their brother was the Messiah. They wouldn't admit it. Later on, this was going to change. Later on, this would change. But for now, they didn't believe in him. So in verse 3, we see, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one wants to become a public, no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. So essentially what they're saying is, Jesus, if you're the Messiah as you claim to be, go straight to Jerusalem. Go to the epicenter of of our Jewish faith right in front of everyone and do your great miracles to show them who you are. Establish yourself. Show them your power to elevate your portfolio, to show them how wonderful you are. Don't you stay in Galilee hiding away. Go straight to the, the center of it all. After all, the Feast of Tabernacles near Jerusalem, Jesus it's going to be a great event. This is a perfect time if you're, if you're the Messiah. Go and show yourself. People from all over the place are going to be there. It would be a great place for you to establish your Messiahship. See? They didn't believe, so that would be... There was a sarcastic tone. There's a sarcastic tone. Can you imagine, though, how you would have felt as Jesus in that scenario? about the comments that your own half-brothers were making about you. They knew that he was doing incredible miracles. Yet they, they doubted and, and they still weren't believing in him. I'm sure this caused Jesus some pain. Some significant pain. You see, his brothers misunderstood the Messiah. They get caught the whole idea that the Messiah was going to be a certain person because that's what they've been taught by the religious leaders. The Messiah is going to do this, this, and this, and this. And he's not going to do this, and this, and this. He's going to come onto the stage as this great, victorious, military champion and kick butt on the Romans. But you know, God does things differently sometimes than what we think he will. I mean, the prophets talked about it. Isaiah 53 is very clear about the suffering servant that the Messiah would be. There's other scriptures that point to it too, but they weren't looking at that because they had their own track that they were caught in. You know, if it was God's purpose to show himself as famous, popular, and powerful, he could have just stayed in heaven. He could have done things totally different. In heaven, God, the Son, is worshipped and adored by millions upon millions of angels who go around the throne crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they fall flat on their faces before Him. And there's great earthquakes that shake the foundations of the temple where He's in. It's going to be an awesome sight when we get there. That's what's, If God wanted to show Himself as famous, popular, and powerful, He could have just stayed put. He, had every, he has all the adoration of the angels. He's going to have our adoration up there too one day. And prayerfully, as Christians, we see that Jesus' posturing in humility was actually a glorious thing. 
It was a glorious thing. Well, the Living Bible says this, and I, I think this catches the spirit of the Greek. It's not a word-for-word translation, but I just wanted to read it to you because I think it, it, it actually holds some bearing here. The same verses 3 to 5 in the Living uh, Paraphrase says, And Jesus' brothers urged him to go to Judea for the celebration. More, go where more people can see your miracles, they scoffed. You can't be famous when you hide like this. If you're so great, prove it to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. That's the kind of the spirit that was there. There's a sarcastic element, teasing element. It seemed that Jesus was just, he was just seeking attention. And if he was the one, well then, let's, let's prove it. Prove it to us. Prove it to them. Go kick some butt. Go establish yourself. And then maybe we'll see. As for Jesus, his intent wasn't simply to draw a crowd. Jesus' intent was to explain the truth that would set people free. He knew that if he compromised his mission, he could become famous, powerful, and popular with those Jewish religious leaders and all the people. But he wasn't interested in outward appearances. He would have told them the truth and And this would have made them hate him even more and try to have him killed even more. It wasn't the right timing for Jesus to be crucified here. He had other things he needed to teach and he needed to do. The most glorious thing that Jesus ever did was to humble himself to become humanity's servant. The Lord, in his greatest act of service to the world, was not to become a figurehead on the outside that was famous, powerful, and popular. His greatest act of service was to become, was to be obedient to the will of the Father, giving his life in exchange for death on a cross, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. He gave his one and only Son to us as a sacrifice. that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The Son of God didn't come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. So Jesus, he knew his mission was to be the substitutionary offering for all of the sinners, including his own family on the earth. He knew it. And sensing his brother's sac- uh, sarcasm, he said, This, in verse 6. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here, for you any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time is not yet fully come. After After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. Now, he knew that if he took his brother's advice and he went with them, they'd probably help elevate him. Look, this is my brother. He says he's the Messiah. Let's see. Right? Jesus knew that if he was to go onto the stage at the Feast of Tabernacles in a public display at that time of of grandeur, he was still going to speak the truth. They were going to hate him and they were going to kill him still. But that wasn't God's timing. It wasn't his timing. Verse 10 we read, However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he also went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? The Jewish leaders who wanted to kill Jesus thought he would likely, with all the miracles that had been happening, he would likely make his grand entrance spectacle at the time of the feast. And they were probably strategically planning how they could take him out sure of it but this didn't happen when they asked where is he they were not wanting to worship him were they they were wanting to destroy him because they had already made up their mind that he wasn't the messiah that they were looking for as a devout jew however jesus desired to attend the feast because he was submitted to the will of the father 
he didn't go and announce it publicly. He went in secret. Was Jesus a coward because he wasn't willing to stand up and go, guess what, guys? I'm going to show you who I am. Was he a coward? No, he was not a coward. Jesus knew that he would eventually be confronted by the world's evil and that he would give his life for that. To, to, the world's evil would come against him and he would give his life willingly because he knew what he was trying to accomplish. His brothers didn't know. Any time could be good. If he's truly the Messiah, then he's going to become the, uh, the greatest thing since sliced bread. He's going to be, he's going to rise and then we'll believe. Having spent some time thinking about this, people, what Jesus did here, why he did it, and how this story can teach us something that we should live by in the context of our lives, there is a real lesson here. And it's not always at, at face value what the lesson is. Let me share this with you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Bible, Bible you know, Paul said, follow Christ as, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. And, and, and Paul followed Christ. I mean, he, Christ was the example. So follow, follow Jesus. If we're followers of Jesus Christ, you know what? Trouble will find you. When you become a true follower of Jesus Christ, it's not going to make it easier out there for you. Trouble will find you. The other gospel that's preached out there, that, that there's not going to be any trouble and all that, that's false teaching. It's not true. If you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you will come into trouble. Trouble will find you. But that's okay. Because God has a plan through it. In this world that we live in, there's going to be people who don't like what you say or stand for as a devoted disciple of Jesus. This is why Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 6, 22, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. So what do we do? Trouble will find us. Are we not to be bold and unashamed of who we are and the principles we stand on? Well, the answer to that question is yes, we are to be bold and unashamed of who we are and the principles we stand on. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, 26, he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This being the case, how do we respond when trouble finds us, when evil men confront us and appear to be planning for our destruction? Do we boldly and publicly confront evil with all the might that we can muster? Do we confront trouble and people without hesitation and step into the ring for a holy fight? After all, as true believers in Jesus, do we not represent a holy God? Should we not be bold and confidently charge full speed with full force into every issue and confront the people who are endangering us and our mission in this world? Do we not do that? It is true that there may be times when we are to confront issues head on. We're to do this in a spirit of love. But we're to speak the truth. But then there are times where God's will for us is to be quiet and to lay low. You see, God has a perfect timing for everything. It's important for us to deal with with things in their proper timing, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit that God has given us to guide us and to direct our paths and understand that it is not every time that God wants us to confront in a situation. We see this in our text today with Jesus. What about when Jesus was first born 
And Herod sent soldiers out to kill him. Well, God could have just provided protection and they, Mary and Joseph could have confronted it and, you know, the soldiers could have dropped when they went and tried to grab a hold of Jesus. They could have, God could have just went boom and leveled them all right there. But he didn't do that, did he? Jesus went with his mom and dad into Egypt to hide from the confrontation. What about the prophet Elijah? Consider his life. Elijah had just finished confronting the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Carmel? Not Caramel. <laughs> or Mount Carmel. Fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice and the altar and everything. And you know what happened? I mean, Baal worship had taken over the land and it had corrupted the people. So Elijah, after God showed he is God, the people cried, he is God. Baal didn't do anything. Elijah had all the prophets of Baal executed to purge the land of all the junk. And guess what happened right after that? Was it smooth sailing? Everyone went, oh, look at the Lord, he is God. And, and um, the altars of Baal didn't produce anything and the altar of God produced results. No, that didn't happen. As soon as Queen Jezebel, wicked king, Queen Jezebel, heard what had happened, she told Elijah this in 1 Kings 19, 2-8. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, May the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Continue reading. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again and a second time touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank, and he went into this, in the strength that the food of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, to Horeb, the mount of God. You see, Elijah was human, and God knew it. God knew he was frail, he was weak. He could have done it a different way. But he allowed Elijah's weakness to show, and he gave him grace in the midst of his weakness, and the Lord didn't hit Elijah and go, what's wrong with you, man? Like, you just finished serving me and I called fire down and consumed your altar and sacrifice and, and I took care of Baal worshippers or the Baal, Baal priests here. I helped you with that, so what's wrong with you? Why are you running from Jezebel? You see, Elijah was human, but Elijah also had a sense of what was right. And he went, under the blessing of God, I might add. Because there was a timing for everything. God proceeded to strengthen Elijah for the task to come. You see, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were going to be dealt with but they were not going to be dealt with by Elijah's hand and the other people in that land who refused to bow their knee to Baal. God was not going to use them to deal with Ahab and Jezebel. He was going to deal with Ahab and Jezebel on his own terms, in his timing, using the means by which he saw fit. And in that particular case, Elijah didn't, have the participation in that. Elijah was called into the wilderness to be refreshed by God. And yes, God had to teach him out there too. Because after this, the, you know, God's like, Elijah, why are you here? And he had to deal with Elijah's heart. 
and the fear that he had and all that, right? He did that, but it was God's will for Elijah to be in the situation that he was in. You see, there's a time and a place for confrontation, and there's a time and a place for non-confrontation, where we pray and we give God what we can't control into his hands, and we say, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? In such circumstances, sometimes God's will is not for direct confrontation at this time because he has a different plan to unfold. Now, some people have developed a real militant theology where they believe that God desires that they stand up against evil things bluntly and face whatever comes every time they approach a situation. To do otherwise would be showing yourself as a coward and being ashamed of the kingdom of God. To such people who buy into this theology, backing away and peacefully praying about something, steering away from the confrontation shows fear and we know that fear is not of God. Well, the bravery of standing up like Stephen in the face of accusations and trouble and becoming a martyr for Christ is commendable if it is the proper thing, if it is in the proper time. Stephen did right by confronting the people that he confronted when he was executed in Acts. God had planned for him to become a martyr. This was in the will of the Father for him to do this. And it was a good thing. There is a time when we need to stand. And that time right there was in the perfect spectrum of God's timing for everything that unfolded in the rest of the history of Christianity. It was perfect in the timing. And no, God doesn't promise that we're not going to get persecuted, that we're not going to have to even give our lives for the, for the Lord. But it doesn't mean that I charge ahead in every circumstance and throw myself in front of the bus. Jesus knew that he had further work to do for the Lord. And that work would not be accomplished if he threw himself in front of that bus. This is what I'm trying to say. Folks, we not only need charisma, we need wisdom and we need discernment that the Holy Spirit can give us. And this is why we need to be people of prayer and we need to approach everything we do very carefully because what appears to be the thing that we should do might not be the thing that we should do. And how do you know the difference? Well, the first thing is God's never going to ask you anything that will contradict his word. He's not going to ask you to do that. And the second thing is, God, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit within you, when you come to a place, he is going to tell you in the way of peace whether you to proceed or whether you are to step back. Don't force it. That's not the plan of God. Go in the peace of the Spirit. In Luke chapter 6, 27 to 31. But to you who are listening, I say, Jesus said this to his disciples. See, Jesus was just about to send his disciples out to take his message to the, to the people of Israel. And this, this message, actually, I'm going to read to you, was a prophetic message, and it just didn't just end in that mission. It was prophetic, and it actually extends to all of his followers till the time that the Son of Man comes back, where Jesus comes back. So, Luke 6, 27 to 31 says this. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, then turn to him also the other. Or the, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do, other, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Bless and do not curse. Bless and do not curse. Bless and do not curse. Let God take care of everything. Yes, when you're brought before a, a tribunal 
and they ask you to, to give a defense for what you do and what you believe and why you believe it, don't worry. The Spirit of God will give you the words to say in those cases. But we are not the hammer, people. We are not the hammer. God is the hammer. He does things in His time. We need to trust Him. Being a bull in a china shop is not God's way because most often... When we're building a china shop, what, gets, what happens? The china gets broken. Things break. See, this is why if a church is likened unto a boat, we are not to be a cruise holiday ship where we go on a holiday. We're not a cruise ship, people. On the lost, on the seas of humanity. If we're a ship right here, we are not a cruise ship. This is not a cruise ship. Neither is this a battleship. If you've heard that saying, it is not true. We are not called to be a battleship. God fights our battles for us when they're needed. We are not called to be a cruise ship. We are not called to be a battleship. We are called to be a rescue ship, a rescue vessel. Because there's people that are shipwrecked in the sea of this world, and they're lost, and they're dying, and they're going under. And we're called to rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. There's a hymn that says this. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Old hymn that's burned into our past as a church. Truth that's spoken through that. And this is why we are to pray in sync with the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Not my kingdom come in the way I should have it done. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And your ways, Lord, are higher than our, our, my ways. Even as the, earth, the heavens are higher than the earth, so your ways are higher than my ways. So God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this circumstance. I don't know how to handle the opposition and the evil that we face in this day, but you do. So I bow my knee to you, God, and I ask you to carry me when I cannot carry myself, to give me words to say when I don't know what to say, to give me strength to stand strong in the midst of persecution when I have to face it, and the wisdom to know when to hide and to retreat. And to pray. And the wisdom to be like a lion. Like Stephen. And speak the truth that will result. Possibly in me being killed. For doing what is right. Jesus said this. Matthew 10. I'm sending you out. Like sheep among wolves. You're the sheep of the Lord. And we're going into a world of wolves. Therefore be shrewd as snakes. And innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses that to them and the Gentiles. But then they arrest you. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it is not, will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and father a father his child. Children will, re will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. See that? Flee to another. Truly I will tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That was to the disciples originally. But there's a prophetic element that reaches to the, the entire church because Jesus hasn't come back yet again. So until that day comes, this is what's going to happen. So going back to our text this morning, Jesus secretly attended the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. People were talking about him and debating whether he was from God because of all the good things God was miraculously doing through him. Along the crowds... There was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he, deserve, he, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Many people suspected that Jesus might be just the promised Messiah that the scriptures foretold. But that wasn't the sentiment of the Jewish religious leaders. 
And there's a lot of people that were kind of on the fence with that. They thought maybe that Jesus might be sent from God, but they were afraid that he wasn't, and they didn't want to mention their thoughts to, uh, about Jesus in public because they knew that they'd get persecuted, and they didn't want that. So here we have it. Jesus wasn't lying when he told his brothers that he wasn't going because he went, but it wasn't in their timing. It wasn't at that time with the agenda that they had in mind that Jesus was going to be attending this feast. Folks, there's a timing for everything. God has timing for us. We need to be sensitive to this and we need his help. Amen. Jesus, we thank you that you love us and you care for us and you have a mission for us. Help us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we walk forward, not to be presumptuous, but to be students of your word and also students of prayer. Father, we pray for your spiritual gifts, for without them, God, we don't know what we can do or how we should do it. We need discernment of spirits, Lord. Father, we need words of knowledge. Father, we, know, we need to know what you want. We need discernment on how we should carry ourselves. Spirit, would you speak into our lives and show us how we should proceed in our lives. Maybe there's people here today that are confronting great evil. And God, they're wondering what to do. God, I just pray that you give them wisdom. Lord, if you want us to stand for something and it's your timing, and even if that leads to us being put to death, Lord, we pray that you'd prepare our hearts for that. Help us, Lord, to know what's best. God, you have a mission for us to accomplish. And you have a perfect timing for that mission. We yield to you, Lord. Thy kingdom come, Lord. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.